Hi everybody. Uh, welcome all to the uh, to the Icarus Hall in Unley. Um, let me start by acknowledging that today we meet on the traditional lands of the Ghana people. We respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders across Australia. On behalf of the Greek Orthodox community of South Australia, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our first event of the 16th Annual Odyssey Greek Festival. This cultural festival is a month of joyous festivities, cultural diversity, bringing together our communities in a celebration of our Greek Hellenic culture. I'd like to extend our gratitude to the Panikarian Brotherhood of South Australia for welcoming us into their home tonight. And I say home because I know there are many Ikarians amongst us here tonight, and no doubt this is your home. Um, much like the Olympic Hall, I'm sure this place also holds some very fond memories for yourselves and your community. Uh, tonight's lecture is, um, is delivered by uh, Yanni Kartlidge and Professor Andrikos Varnava, two young gentlemen with a very keen interest in history. The presentation looks at a secret census which was carried out by Australian Special Intelligence and catalogued all Greeks in Australia in 1916. The secret census registered the names of Greeks and Greek businesses, as well as their genders, ages, professions, places of abode, naturalisation status, modes of transport and distance from state capitals, with a view of possible internment if Greece, which was neutral at the time, decided to join the Central Powers. This presentation also explores the attacks on Greeks during the period and how anti-migrant sentiments questions of wartime loyalties and issues of naturalisation all contributed to the monitoring of Greeks as a suspect community. This research also reviews and contests the general accepted number of Greeks in Australia during this period and has a strong South Australian focus. At the conclusion of tonight's presentation, um, there will be an opportunity for a brief Q&A with our presenters um, followed by some sandwiches, um, wine, and I think we've just got water tonight, so no orange juice. Um, with that, I will um, I will pass you over to our presenters and stay our evening. Uh, thank you once again for joining us here at the Icarus Hall. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Thank you to Goxa and Peter for organising tonight and to the Panikarian Brotherhood for hosting us. Um, really appreciate everyone, uh, everyone's support on this and for Andrekos for working on this project with me. Um, uh, so we're looking at what they've been, has been termed the secret census. So on the 15th of June 1916, WH Raymond, the Commissioner of Police for South Australia, ordered all his inspectors and sub-inspectors to obtain confidential information as to the number, residence and occupation of Greeks resident in the state of South Australia as nearly as can be ascertained, and that any rendezvous such as cafes, clubs, um, etc. frequented by Greeks should be kept under observation and the names of proprietors, uh, managers and nat nature of such establishments furnished. So within two weeks, the SA police had submitted a list with 178 names and 18, uh, 18 establishments. Such orders were received in every Australian state in June 1916 from the Inspector General's Office of the Commonwealth Government on behalf of the Special Intelligence Bureau. The so-called secret census, as Hugh Gilchrist termed it, counted the number of Greeks resident in each state and the number of businesses run by Greeks. This was ordered because the Australian authorities questioned the loyalty of the Greek-Australian community to the Allied war effort. The Greek government was neutral at the time, uh, but considered sympathetic to the Central Powers, specifically to Germany, because the King of Greece, Constantine I, was married to the Kaiser's sister, and many armed officers had trained in Germany. So the primary focus of this talk is to explore the secret census as part of the story of Australian migrant communities and wartime loyalties. It is an early example of the Australian authorities monitoring migrant groups considered suspect during times of world war. Although the Commonwealth government may have been motivated by wartime concerns, attacks on the Greeks, including physical violence by the wider Australian community had clear racial and xenophobic characteristics 
Uh, for some Australians, disloyalty from migrant communities certainly impassioned their discontent and raised tensions, but so do did the tension that bloody foreigners had taken their jobs or had established viable businesses that they perceived threatened them. So as a result of this research, the number of Greeks in Australia um, will be challenged based on the numbers in the secret census and the numbers of naturalisation in 1916, um, who were not, and as well as those not included in the secret census. Uh, so in recent years, more research has been published on the Greek Australian communities before the post-World War II mass migration. Um, so this talk builds on this research by challenging the accuracy of the censuses and examining the attacks on the Greek community, discussing Greek naturalisation applications and exploring the Greek secret censuses. Uh, so only a handful of historians have discussed the Greek secret census. Um, approaching it from their focus on Greek-Australian history and not broader migrant surveillance. Uh, Gilchrist first discovered the secret census in the National Archives in the, uh, in the 80s, and in 1977 he broadly analysed the secret census, especially the occupation of Greeks and the background of the Great War. Gilchrist also typed out and annotated the secret census, kept his collection at the National Library of Australia, and he asserted that this was one of the very few secret censuses taken in Australia during the war. And while no official use appears to have been made of the information, of the more than 2,000 listed, only seven were deemed to harbour disloyal sentiments. Uh, several others who have listed here have mentioned that the secret census occurred, but not have, uh, have not added too much further. Um, so referring to it as a secret census obscures the fact that this was part of the police surveillance of the state on suspect communities. So this talk aims to apply and historicise the term suspect communities, which is first used by Paddy Hilliard to describe the heavy policing of the Irish uh, in Britain during the 1970s and 80s. Others have used it in several recent studies to describe the actions of authorities against other groups in the contemporary government security agenda. So other examples include Italians in interwar Australia and Cypriots in interwar and post-war uh, post Britain and Australia. Uh, two other contributions explored cases from the Great War in Australia, one on undesirable women and the other on Syrian and Greek naturalisation. So this talk further historicises the idea of suspect communities in the context of Greek Australians in the F First World War Australia. So we argue that the Australian authorities and the broader Australian community saw the Greek community as suspect for slightly different reasons. Uh, the government was focused on preparations to intern Greeks if Greece entered the war on the side of the central powers. Although there was a racial dimension to this targeting, the primary motivation followed the practice of interning wartime enemy aliens. And the fact, however, that they were monitored and that such preparations were made uh, at all for not only foreign nationals but also Australian nationals of Greek heritage was unique. Few other groups were monitored in this way and to this extent and um, certainly no, not persons from neutral countries. One comparable group were Turks in Australia uh, when a secret list was compiled in 1918 although the Ottoman Empire had been an enemy state after joining the power, uh, Central Powers in November 1914. Other migrant groups were monitored during, the following, uh, during and following World War I, although none to the extent of the Greeks, given the breadth and depth of the information recorded when compared to other monitored groups, uh, who only usually had their names, genders and addresses noted. So these lists were likely also inspired by the success of the secret census. Uh, the Germans and Austro-Hungarians are additionally comparable, however they were overtly monitored as enemy aliens, with many interned, and this is an important distinction with the Greeks. Uh, the government had created the category of enemy aliens and was essentially fitting Greeks into it. This was tied with the issues of disloyalty, including Constantine's German sympathies, which spurred on attacks against Greeks. So the attacks also coincided with events in the Balkans, which saw Greece refuse the offer of Cyprus to immediately enter the war, and aid Serbia, which was soon overrun by Bulgarian forces. So this study is divided into four guiding areas that constitute the four sections. 
So firstly, uh, we'll look at the numbers of Greeks in Australia and where the numbers are adjusted based on evidence from the archives, especially from naturalisation papers post-1915 and from the secret census. Secondly, the attacks on Greeks during the period are examined and discussed, uh, mainly using the newspapers, though some archival documents were also consulted. Thirdly, the 1915 naturalisation suspension is explored using archival material, uh, specifically from the Home and Territories Department. And finally, the secret census itself is interrogated with a focus on South Australia as a case study, and this provides a closer look at the type of information collected and further unravels the attitudes present during the monitoring of the Greeks. Uh, so, in exploring the secret census and naturalisation numbers, it was discovered that the Greek numbers in the 1911 census uh, were lower than the real numbers. So this fact was discerned based on the number of applications for naturalisation, which was 3,000 in 1916, and the number of persons and businesses which, list, which were listed in the secret census. Um, estimating the true number of Greeks in Australia is paramount when interrogating the secret census and when understanding why the secret census and violence against Greeks took place. So the 1911 census included a range of terminologies which together can help unravel the nature of Greeks living in Australia. These terminologies were such as birthplace, ethnicity, nationality and religion add to the complexity of the census and often mask the self-identities of those being counted. So Greeks were better described as those of a Greek-speaking and usually Eastern Orthodox background, encompassed a range of different national cultural, religious and socio-economic identities in Australia. Uh, the no most notable were Greeks from the Kingdom of Greece that also had Greek nationality, uh, but there were also Greek speakers from the Ottoman Empire, British Empire via Cyprus and Egypt, and the Italian uh, Empire in the Dodecanese, and those from various autonomous or shortly independent islands, including Crete, Ikaria and Samos. Also, the Ionian Islands had been part of the British Empire, up until uh, 1864, and many who lived outside Greece maintained their British identity, um, including those who had emigrated to Australia. So these identities were not captured properly in the census, and there is often confusion, and the majority of Greeks in Australia during this period were Greek islanders and Ottoman subjects, so they had traversed the extremities of these identities. Uh, so the census in 1911 ultimately listed six birthplaces associated with Greeks. These were Greece, Turkey, Egypt, Cyprus, Crete and Samos. Uh, the inclusion of Crete and Samos testified to the diversity in Greek nationalities. Turkey, or which was the Ottoman Empire, was counted as a European country, likely due to the nature of the Ottomans in Australia being mostly Christians. Um, and in total, the census noted as many as 2,325 Greeks and this demonstrates that the Australian authorities had a broad understanding and labelling of who was in their eyes Greek. Uh, additionally, the 1911 census also categorised by religion. So this was more nuanced than birthplaces and paints a different picture of Greeks in Australia. So the main category noted was Greek Catholic and the term Greek Catholic itself with is loaded with complexities. However, most scholars acknowledge that it was a misnomer that denoted Eastern Orthodoxy more broadly, as well as the Eastern denominations not included uh, in communion with Rome. And it does not denote the Ukraine's Ruthenians, who are also called Greek Catholics, or Greece's Catholic minority, as they did not have notable presences in Australia. Uh, this is also supported by the birthplaces of Greek Catholics, who with Greece being the largest portion, followed by Australasia, Russia and Syria, and the total number of Greek Catholics being 2,580, uh, not including the Russian Church and others. So um, was higher than those listed under birthplaces, which likely accounts for Australian-born children of Greek immigrants, as well as Orthodox people from other nations. So the secret census gives a different number of Greeks in Australia, According to Gilchrist, it listed 2,398 Greeks in Australia, excluding the Northern Territory, which took its own register of Greeks and Maltese in November 1916. Um, when we add the Northern Territory numbers, the total is 2,662, 
What is overlooked, though, is that the secret census did not count many of the women and children, um, Australian-born Greeks or Greek landowners. Uh, some known non-Orthodox Greeks were also missing. So given how many were applying for naturalisation in 1916, which was around 3,000, compared to the secret census, uh, we know that the latter did not count all Greeks. So if 3,000 Greeks were applying to be naturalised, we must also consider how many already had been. So we therefore estimate that between 1911 and 1916, there were as many as three and a half to 4,000 Greeks in Australia, and that this differs a lot with the 1911 census, and it was not the result of a mass settlement, but rather uh, a, a lack of recording. Uh, so the number is in addition to those already naturalised as well. Um, some of this, though, is in, did increase due to some turmoil in the Aegean, such as the Balkan Wars, which pushed many Ottoman, Islander, Ottoman and Islander Greeks to emigrate. However, it also, as mentioned, uh, points to a lack of proper recording. So at the end of the next official census in 1921, there were three, over uh, three and a half thousand persons born in Greece, and we argue that these numbers are in line with the larger estimates of Greeks in Australia during the decade from 1911 to 1921, as proposed here. Um, I'll pass over to Andreko to take over. Thank you, Yanni. So I'm going to talk about the attacks on the Greeks in Australia. The larger number of Greeks in Australia that Yanni spoke about was corroborated by the Greek community in 1919 when it was claimed in the Northern Territory Times and Gazette that there were over 2,000 Greeks from Castellorizo alone in Australia. <clears throat> in reply, one reader questioned the nature of the Castellorizians' ethnicity and denoted them as Asiatics, echoing the decade's xenophobic tone stating that they were, that they loaf, and I quote, loaf under verandas and in cook shops. God help us if these men are considered specimens of good settlers and citizens. We cannot forget how our troops were murdered by the Greeks when the Allies went to their assistance. Now these comments stemmed from the same loaded questions of loyalty, race, and or racism, labor that sparked the secret census two and a half years earlier, feeding into the racial dynamics underpinning the attacks. Now from 1915 to 16, there were many anti-Greek riots and demonstrations around the country. This was despite many Greek communities such as that in Port Piri, publicly declaring their allegiance to the allies. The attacks were generally aimed at small businesses run by Greeks in cities and rural towns and factory workers in rural townships. In New South Wales, there were attacks on Greeks noted in the newspapers at Sydney, Glen Innes, Haymarket, Manly, Newcastle and Liverpool. So there weren't just one or two, there's a number of locations. These were in November and December of 15. In Sydney and Haymarket, Greek businesses and nearby shops were targeted by Australian soldiers. Michael Cassimatti's Oyster Saloon near the Town Hall, Miss McEwen's Milnery Shop and Serba Brothers' shop were attacked by the rioters who smashed windows with large lumps of concrete and blue metal. The police drew their batons and there were both rioters and police injured. Eight soldiers and additional civilians were arrested. Similarly, at Manly, a Greek restaurant and an Italian, or perhaps it was a Greek fruit shop, were targeted, and 23 soldiers and two civilians were charged with having disturbed the peace. While they attacked the Greeks with stones <coughs> and pipes and a revolver was shot, they shouted, we want those Greeks. Few rioters were ever prosecuted. The event was sparked by a previous altercation at Cassimati's shop where a soldier died from injuries. One of the soldiers said, and I quote, the man who killed our mate was a Greek. And another said, a Dago killed my mate who fought with me in the trenches at Gallipoli. We intend to have satisfaction. As many as 2,000 people were present during the riot. 
Uh, Greek businesses had to be closed for over a week following these events. About a week later, in November of 1915, there, uh, there were about a thousand soldiers <coughs> that rioted at Liverpool in New South Wales, smashing the windows um, of the Railway Golden Fleece and Collingwood Hotels and attacking a train and a Greek shop. They were throwing stones and bottles, had been drinking and demanding, and demanding patriotic drinks from the hotel keepers and clashed violently with the police. Similar scenes were seen in Newcastle on, fr on the Friday night of the 10th of December of 1915. The soldiers from Liverpool were joined by a crowd from the local camp. The next night, yet another disturbance occurred at a Greek fish shop in George Street, Sydney, and a soldier was injured and an arrest was made. According to the secret census, there were only 55 Greeks in Newcastle. Newcastle's mayor protested at the attacks, and I quote, no good purpose could be served by misconduct. The Greeks of the city held a meeting yesterday where they claimed that they were law-abiding citizens. Some of them said that they were naturalized subjects. It was decided to, cl to close up their shops for the time being. Since the war started, the Greeks here have contributed liberally to the patriotic funds. Friday's, Friday night's demonstration has been condemned by all sides. These mostly soldier-led attacks were generally sparked by questions of Greek loyalty to Australia. This is despite at least 80 Greek Australians serving overseas in the Australian Armed Forces during the war, and compared to only seven being found disloyal by the secret census. This question of disloyalty surfaced in a riot in Glen Innes in December of 1915, where members of the public requested that an image of Lord Kitchener, you know, Lord Kitchener, the War Secretary back in London, be removed from a window in a Greek shop. <clears throat> the mob, for about five, five to six hundred, was led by a returned Russian soldier, and they demanded the picture from the shop or threatened to destroy it. That is the shop, not, not just the picture. The Greeks refused and the mob attacked the shop with stones, breaking three windows. A police sergeant convinced the Greeks to surrender the picture. The incident forced the closure of the Greek businesses again. Interestingly, there were only 11 Greeks recorded in Glen Innes, according to the secret census. <clears throat> now, the attacks on Greek Australians and Greeks in Australia at the end of 1915 were inspired by multiple factors. There were deep racial prejudices and concerns over jobs taken by migrants, but these underlying feelings were also sparked by the position of Greece in the war, especially in relation to, the, to those attacks just mentioned in November and December of 1915. The main reason was that in October of 1915, the British government offered Cyprus to Greece on the condition that it entered the war on the Entente side and immediately aid Serbia. The Greek royalist government rejected the offer and Bulgarian forces overran Serbia. As you can see here, this was widely reported upon in the Australian newspapers. This is a screenshot from a Trove search of, of Cyprus 1915. You can see 3,000 uh, hits for 1915, but you can see the hits are mainly for October. As soon as it happens, the offer is rejected. The talk in the newspapers is about this. <clears throat> the later attacks in, there are later attacks as well in, uh, towards the end of 1916. These attacks uh, were primarily driven by a very similar thing happening. Um, on Tont and Venizelist efforts to persuade the royalist government back in Athens to abandon its neutrality and join them. By that point in time, Venizelos had established a second government in Salonika and had allowed Allied troops to land. Um, failed, you know, and uh, the relations uh, irreparably broke down during what are known as the Noemvriana when the Entente and Venezuela's troops clashed with the royalists in the streets of Athens. In 
In WA, the violence continued throughout the following year. In 1916, the Greek community in WA numbered around 1,000, despite only 285 being listed in the secret census, with the great majority from the Aegean Islands, which supported the Greek Prime Minister Venizelos. Despite this, large-scale violent anti-Greek riots broke out at Kalgoorlie and Perth in late 1916 because they were, and I quote, being treated as actual enemies. Greek-Australian community leader Peter Michailidis had appealed to Venizelos for support and was taking the matter up in London and advised the WA Greeks to request protection from the Governor-General. Michailidis wrote to the Governor-General on the 20th of December of 1916, claiming that, and I quote, for more than a year past, people here and the press have misunderstood the position and a belief exists that all Greeks are treacherous and must not be tolerated, with the result that the majority of our shops have been repeatedly smashed, the contents looted, and nothing is left undone to make our living here impossible. <coughs> the matter was serious because they, and I quote, live in continual terror, now even of our lives. Although they supported Venizelos and the emancipation of enslaved peoples and demanded immediate steps be taken to protect them. Similarly, the honorary president of the Greek community of New South Wales, Jay Camino, led a deputation to the acting Greek consul expressing their sympathies with the Allies, asking him to convey these sentiments officially and to the press. In 1920, compensation was sought by the Greek community of WA, backed by the consul, although the Australian government rejected the claims. Gilchrist put the mob violence down to the and I quote, chauvinistic sentiments and soldiers on leave from training camps, sometimes the worst for liquor. However, the clear anti-Greek sentiments derived from deeper racially motivated ideologies and paranoias in Australian society triggered by questions over Greek disloyalties to the Allies. The racial aspect included the question of foreigner labour, which also dominated articles in the newspapers. One from January of 1916 was titled Greek Maltese and Egyptians, their value as workers, echoed these discussions. Such articles made racialized comments about Mediterranean work ethics, portraying the Greeks as lazy fellows, four of them about equals one average Australian trench toiler. Protests against foreign workers had been frequent during the early 1910s, with anti-immigration demonstrations organised by the British Immigration League in 1911 and 14 in Port Adelaide, and in 1913, the Amalgamated Miners Association Union protested against foreign miners working for BHP. Port Pirie experienced further targeted attacks on Greeks and Greek businesses in 1917, with rocks being thrown, gunshots fired, and race-motivated chanting. Hislop noted that in the 1910s, white laborism was a prominent ideology among the working class in the British Empire, with 1914 seeing the largest British labor demonstration of the early 20th century in Hyde Park, and a white workers' general strike in Johannesburg. There are also anti-Greek riots elsewhere in the Anglosphere, notably in South Omaha, Nebraska in 1909, in Toronto in 1918, there were Ku Klux Klan attacks on Greeks in Utah during the 1920s, and so forth. These ideologies, coupled with Australia's founding race laws, especially the White Australia Policy and Immigration Restriction Act, culminated in a disdain for Mediterranean workers from much of the working class Australian society and tropes of, and I quote, cheap foreign and dark labour remained a theme into the interwar period. Coupled with the public perceptions of Greek disloyalty, these intertwined race and labor prejudices influenced the decision to begin monitoring Greeks in Australia. To be socially accepted and included and to combat societal prejudices, Greek citizens applied for naturalization. So we're up to the naturalization now. Naturalisation demonstrated allegiance to Australia and Britain and offered security. Being naturalised gave an answer to the wider public on the question of Greek loyalty to Australia. Until 1915, 
The practice was to refer each application to the police for a report on the applicant, and if favourable, they would be naturalised. In 1915, however, it was proposed to suspend the processing of all applications from Greek citizens, and I quote, in view of the doubtful attitude of Greece in regard to the international situation, by that they mean the Great War, it is suggested that applications be held over for the present and applicants advised accordingly. Under the memorandum, a note stated that the cabinet had decided on the 30th of October 1914 that all, and I quote, enemy subjects over 60 years of age might be naturalized and that this would also apply to the Greeks, even though they weren't an enemy alien. This indicated that the, the recommendation in the memorandum was approved and that the Greeks under 60 would be denied naturalization, although they were not, as I mentioned, enemy aliens. <coughs> as with the attacks on the Greeks late in 1916, this followed the uh, Athens rejecting the British offer to cede Cyprus to Greece in return for immediately entering the war and aiding Serbia. The restriction on naturalizations compares to the barring of military-aged male Italians from naturalization in 1917. Now, after King Constantine I abdicated on the 11th of June 1917 and Venizelos returned as a unified prime minister of, of Greece, uh, that officially entered the war on the Allied side, the Home and Territories Department reconsidered the restrictions on Greek naturalization. It referred to how, and I quote, when it was seen that the attitude of Greece was that of a potential enemy, it was decided that naturalization of Greeks should be suspended. This now suggested that the consideration should be given to lifting the suspension and revert to the previous practice of obtaining a police report since Greece, and I quote, if not practically an ally, is a neutral. It eventually decided to lift the suspension. Around 3,000 Greeks had applied for naturalization between 1916 and 17. By 1918, the Venizelos government was trying to more fully mobilize Greek forces. In keeping with such efforts within the British Empire, it ordered its consul in Australia, Maniaki, to ask the government to refer all applications for naturalization by Greek citizens to him. The Venizelos government was concerned that Greeks were seeking Australian naturalization to avoid serving in the Greek colors. And I quote, as naturalization will prevent the enforcing of the mobilization degrees by my government, I desire to prevent Greeks taking advantage of Australian law to avoid serving their country. Notice the language, their country. He's claiming them as Greeks. The Home and Territories Department accepted Maniaki's request, but wanted to know the ages between which men were liable and if it would also apply to those physically unfit for military service, married men, and those absent for Greece, from Greece sorry, for many years. And if so, how many years, and those who had already completed their military service. Maniaki replied that if physical disability was proved, those men could be naturalized, as could those over 40, but nobody else was exempted. The Australian government agreed to the Greek request. <clears throat> it, was dis it decided to ask all applicants to prove their age, unless it was manifestly obvious, and sent applicants under, uh, aged under 40 to Maniaki for approval. This effectively gave the Greek authorities the right to veto the application of Greek men in Australia for naturalization. Despite this veto, the Greek authorities went ahead in August 1918 to issue a public warning in Australian newspapers noted by the Australian government to Greeks contemplating Australian naturalization. You can see. Yeah. Maniaki warned Greeks seeking Australian naturalization that it did not protect persons from the laws of their mother country and persons naturalized in Australia were still liable to be punished under Greek laws if they returned there. He also warned that Australian naturalization would not help them overseas unless the British consul was willing to help them, presumably owing to a lack of Australian consular services overseas and that it was better to be, I quote, an alien. In December 1918, about a month after the signing of the armistice, Maniaki advised the Australian authorities that he no longer wanted to see 
the Greek applications for naturalization. The suspension and later referral of applications to Maniaki was ultimately another layer of suspect community monitoring experienced by the Greeks in Australia. So now I'm going to pass over to Yanni again to talk about the South Australian uh, case study. Thanks, Andreko. Um, so this section further explores the secret census by interrogating the data on SA. Um, in this period, SA, the SA Greek community was small and concentrated around Adelaide and Port Piri. Uh, the secret census is noted as having 178 Greeks in South Australia, though it is unclear if all were counted, including females, children, Greek descendants and non-Orthodox Greeks. Despite the possible missing numbers, this number is larger than the 1911 census and the 1921 census, although these numbers are just those listed by birthplace. What they do confirm, however, is the importance of the secret census as a resource when determining how many Greeks were in Australia in the interwar period. So the question of who was included in the secret census is important to understanding the nature of the monitoring. Evidently, Greeks meant those who were Greek-speaking and Orthodox, regardless of whether their birthplaces were Greece or the Ottoman Empire. And for instance, many counted were born in Macedonia or the Aegean Islands, including Crete, Chios and Nicaria, which it all had only just recently left the Ottoman Empire um, and joined Greece in 1912 and 13. Others listed their birthplaces simply as Turkey, but were noted as claiming to be Greek. Of the 178 counted, only 14 were female and only 4 were under the age of 18. This is due to either a lack of recording or supports the common assertion that most Greek migrants in this period were single males. Um, of those counted, 108 were labourers, with 100 of those working at the Port Piri uh, BHP smelters. Most others worked in forms of hospitality, fishing or were retired. And this painted the picture of the Greek community of SA as working class and male dominated. There were at least two landowning families with Greek origins um, excluded from the secret census. So the Norths or Tramodanas and Raleigh families. So George Tramodana North was the first Greek settler in SA and that's him on the right. Um, arriving at Port Adelaide in 1842. With his English wife, Lydia Vosper, they converted to Roman Catholicism, bought land and settled outside Port Lincoln to raise their sons and had 22 grandchildren. Similarly, uh, Stephen S. Raleigh, the London-born grandson of refugees from the Chios massacre, settled in SA in the 1880s. Raleigh, who straddled uh, between being Orthodox and Anglican, purchased 15,200 acres in Balaclava in 1886 and raised racehorses and Shropshire sheep. Um, and that's him seated in the middle uh, with a dog on his lap there. Um, in, in 1911, uh, Raleigh's English wife, Ida Cecil Beck, whom he married in the UK in the 1900s, arrived, and two of their three sons were later born in Adelaide. So the omission of these two families raises further questions about the qualifications to be counted. For instance, were these families omitted because they were non-Orthodox? Was it class-based due to them being pastoralists? As agriculturalists, is it, it is possible that they were valued more than small business owners, factory workers and labourers? Was it due to birthplace? Raleigh was born in England and the North children and grandchildren were born in SA. Was there a racial dimension and these families were considered examples being, of being assimilated into white Anglo-Celtic culture? Um, having anglicised surnames, North and Raleigh, and being naturalised were not the reasons that they were omitted, as others that were naturalised and had anglicised surnames were counted, such as the Considine and Morris families of Adelaide, uh, John Carr of a uh, Adelaide as well, um, and the Port Adelaide uh, residents, John Congier and Andrew Cifoli, and the two, men in, uh, the two fishermen in Port Wakefield, John Black and Peter Dolph, among others as well. So essentially, the omission uh, of the North and Raleigh families was due to a mix of religion, birthplace, class, land ownership, and assimilation, as these disqualified them from being considered disloyal if Greece joined the Central Powers. 
There were also other anomalies in the recording. For instance, some non-Greeks were counted in the SA secret census. Ali Lem Alem of Alexander Street, Port Piri, who was a hawker born in Syria, uh, found his way onto the list. Another, the smelter worker Michael Hessen of David Street, Port Piri, um, who was likely an Orthodox Syrian or Lebanese migrant. Uh, these, these men were probably counted due to being Orthodox and of Ottoman Empire origin. There was also Port Piri fisherman Alex Said, who claimed he was a Persian, and three other smelter workers um, listed here who were all born in Turkey and noted uh, as claiming that they were Christian Turks. Um, so this was, though this was done, possibly done to distance themselves from being identified as Greek. So these blurred lines also beg the question of whether the Greek community in Port Piri was aware that they were being counted. So the inconsistencies also reveal some of the um, aims of the secret census, which included being a list to facilitate internment or even deportation. This would have extended beyond Greek nationals to those of Orthodox Eastern Mediterranean descent, either out of a misunderstanding um, of their Orthodox identity or to cover all bases with religion being the most consistent qualifying factor. However, given those omitted from the secret census, landowning Australian Greeks were not likely to be interned if this did happen. Questions of distance from capital, methods of communication and transportation, and number of Greek-owned businesses and establishments, as well as the ethnic makeup of each business's clientele, also spoke to these aims. So in the, in the event of internment, the knowledge of distance would correlate directly to transporting internees, and the list of businesses would denote key locations to seek out Greeks if they were not at their addresses. The Secret Census provided a complete guide to interning or deporting working class Greek Orthodox males who were seen as the most likely to cause a threat and behave disloyally if Greece became an enemy nation. So this racial profiling was repeated with other ethnic groups as mentioned, but not to the extent and detail that it was with the Greeks in 1916. So two years after the secret census in August 1918, following aliens registration regulations in Australia, there was a secret list of 489 Turks compiled it only included males and counted Syrians, Armenians and some Jews and Greek Orthodox Christians as well, with most being in New South Wales uh, and Victoria and only seven in South Australia. So this list was not as detailed and methodological as the secret census and J.S. Hari questioned it, um, asking, oh, stating that quite a number of Greeks in Australia um, who should have registered as Turkish subjects have not done so but have registered as Greeks. Additionally, many of those listed in the Turkish list were Greek-speaking Christian Ottomans, including some who were counted also in the secret census. This includes uh, Dimitrios Angelitis of Sydney and the Tavlaridis family of Brisbane and Sydney. So this illustrated the blurred line of identity between Greeks, Turks and Ottomans, with Australian authorities often confused, and the strained relationship with Greek Australians identifying with Ottoman identity no doubt was a leftover effect of the divisions of World War I and the Australian populace's view of Turks. So the detail seen in the initial secret census of Greeks was absent in the list of Turks, as was the case with other lists compiled of foreigners in Australia. I'm gonna pass to Andrekos for some concluding thoughts.